I'll see. And then this Saturday, for everybody in the choir, say choir clinic. There'll be a choir clinic this Saturday at 10 a.m. And then praise team practice will be the following Tuesday at 6 p.m. for musicians, 7 p.m. for singers. Let's all pray that the snow stops and it turns to rain, if nothing else. I'd like God just to move it north of us. We don't even have rain, but uh, we'll take rain over snow any day. Any day. We've got prayer requests this morning for Brother Bobby Parker. He's on his way to the hospital, asking God to move on his behalf. Let's remember Sister Dawn Kasner, Brother Steve Kasner this morning, Brother Kelvin Coffey. Uh, I'm sure there's, help me out, I'm, there's others' names that I'm missing, I'm sure. Brother, Brother and Sister Klein, Brother and Sister Klein are in need of prayer this morning. Sister Tina Coffey. That's Sister Jesse Shambaugh. All right. There are so many needs that we have around us every day. Some of us came in this morning with needs in our own lives. I wonder if we couldn't just lift our hands, take one or two of these requests before the Lord, and ask Him to move. God, I believe. I believe you are a healer. God, and I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Church said amen. I wonder if we couldn't clap our hands and give God a praise this morning as we enter into praise and worship. That's why we're here. We're here to entertain the King. We're here to worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sanctuary, we lift our hands to give you the glory. We lift our hands to give you the praise. We will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will praise you for the rest of our days. We lift our hands, we lift our hands in the sanctuary. We lift our hands, we lift our hands to give you the glory. We lift our hands to give you the praise. We lift our hands Lord to give you the glory We lift our hands to give you the praise We will praise you for the rest of our days Yes We will praise you for the rest of our days We clap our hands in the sanctuary We clap our hands to give you the glory We clap our hands to give you the praise Clap our hands to give you the praise. We will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will. We will praise you for the rest oh, of our days. We sing our song, sing our song in the sanctuary. We sing our song, Lord, to give you the glory. We sing our song to give you the praise. We will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will. We sing our song to give you the glory. We sing our song to give you the praise. We will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will praise you for the rest of our days. Oh, Jesus, we give you the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated if you want to and feel like it. How many came this morning needing something from God? You're in the right place this morning. Because where the presence of the Lord is, there's healing, there's liberty. Whatever you need is in this place this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Worship Him with us as we sing. Yeah. 
magic wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. from the front to the back, from the east to the west, and give our King glory. Give our King praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. It's good to know the God that we serve. It's good to have the revelation of who God is. Because there is one God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're asking the ushers to come this morning. We're going to take up this morning's offering. Give is given unto the Lord. Worship with us as we sing. You may be seated. Before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, oh God on high, stepped out into time, and he wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our Child. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's love him all over this house. Hallelujah. How many have been free? How many are delivered this morning? You're sitting in the house of the Lord because there is a God that loves you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. As you remain standing, I'm going to dismiss the 12th through 14, or 12th through graduation of high school, pardon me. Turn this service to our pastor. Would you greet him to this pulpit with an apostolic amen? amen. Young singles are going downstairs as well. I apologize. Hallelujah. As we transition into adult, amen, Bible class, Isaiah chapter 22. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. Oh, and is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me. It's amazing. Somebody say, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend. God, he calls me friend. I am a prince and I am a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend of God. Yeah, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Oh, who am I saying? Who am I that you are mindful of me? Oh, that you hear me when I call. It's amazing, say, Lord, I am a friend of God. I am a friend, say, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend, say, I am a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Hallelujah. God Almighty, He's the Lord of glory. That kind of God calls me friend. He is God Almighty, Lord of glory. He has called me friend. He is God. So glad I know the Lord. Man, he's so merciful to us, ain't he? If you've never experienced the power of God today, you need to experience the power of God with the evidence of repentance of your sins. Baptism in the only saving name, which is the only name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus Christ. And you must be able to fill with the Holy Ghost. Isaiah chapter 22, verse number 20. It's so good to have all of our visitors with us today. Visitor, we greet you in Jesus' name. means the world when you come to our church and thank you for coming today like to, days like today I just think about how great God is so I apologize for my song and, uh, but I just you know you look outside and you see the snow and you know a God that knows how to hold that snow and the treasures of heaven and he designs each snowflake and knows how to do it so well Isaiah chapter 22 Verse number 20. God help me. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And it shall be, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key, everybody say the key. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. And he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Amen. I want to preach to you today on exercising the keys that God has given us. Exercising the keys that God has given us. Thank you, Sister Adams. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Assyria had invaded Judah, as Isaiah had warned and told about. But the Jewish leaders were trusting in Egypt to deliver this nation. One of the treacherous leaders was a man named of Shebna, who had used his office for his own private gain, and he had become a privateer, if you will, of our day. And God said that he would be removed, and a faithful man named Eliakim would be put in his place, who would be given the keys of authority to administer to the kingdom on behalf of King Hezekiah. The Hebrew word translated key comes from a root word which means to open or to loose or to free. So this man was going to have the opportunity to open, loose, or free the people of God. The Greek word translated key comes from a root word which means to shut or to obstruct or to withhold. So the keeper of the keys has the power to one, open And two, shut anything that it comes in contact with. It is a symbol of power and authority in this scripture and in this time. This was a key that God was going to give a church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, When he said these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key. Of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. God gives the church some keys. Number one. Somebody shout number one. He gives them the key of knowledge. It is the authority of the word of God. I've come to preach to you today. Forget all of the man-made religions that are out there. Forget what you've heard or how bad you've been hurt. Forget all the things you've learned according to a man. Let's get back to just old-fashioned word from the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's not in the book, it's not right. If it's added to the book, it's not right. Got to have a key to unlock some doors in this place. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ Himself, when faced against Satan of this world, the kingdoms of this world, when He would come in contact with a demon, He would not battle them on His own merits or even in His own name. But when Satan came around in that beginning of His ministry, Jesus had one word for Satan, and that was, "It is written." I've come to preach to you today and to tell you that there is no way that anybody in this world can conquer one devil by themselves. But because of the word of God, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Uh, I give you power. Oh, come on, somebody in this place. Uh, Behold, in my name, uh, you shall cast out devils. Uh, The promise is still in the word of God. Uh, We got to get back to the old-fashioned apostolic word uh, from God. Uh, Who cares what man has to say? Uh, Who cares what anybody says? Uh, It's the word that's going to keep us. Uh, It's the word that's going to keep us. Jesus was talking. He said, woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Somebody shout key. Ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. 
The key of knowledge is the scriptures. The scribes reserved the exclusively for themselves. And Jesus compared spiritual knowledge to a temple into which they should have led the people. But whose gate they had closed and they had locked. They had the opportunity to bring people into the temple of God. But instead, they kept people out of the temple of God. And Jesus comes with a message of woe. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken the key of knowledge, and you've not entered in yourself. And those that wanted to come in, you hindered. I want to tell you today, there's something that bothers me about this truth. And that is that I am the only one right now in this city that I know of that knows the truth. I can't depend on you. I can't depend on my, my father and my bishop. I can't depend on Brother Bert. I've got to attack this thing like I hold the key to the knowledge of God that this world needs to know. I've come to tell you, I am not shy about here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I am not shy that there is no salvation in any other name. I am not shy that you can't come into this kingdom under the title. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you must receive baptism in the name of Jesus. We got to get back to the key. We must understand that we have been given the key. God has given the church some knowledge. Amen. The Bible says in Mark 1 and 22, they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. You know when you're getting religious and you're not in an experience with God. When you stop teaching in authority and you start teaching like a religious person. You know you're getting religious when you stop realizing how powerful the knowledge that you have is. And you start treating it like your personal salvation moment. That's not for anybody else. Jesus was not going to give us a key so that we could keep it ourselves. Church, I don't know if you realize how powerful this message is. I don't know if you realize how powerful this message is. This message is the only message. It's quiet in this house this morning. I don't know if the snow is muffling your amens, but... But Jesus was given us the knowledge that this is the only way. There is not more than one way into heaven. I've come to tell you there is only one door. And Jesus Christ is that door. Nobody can enter any other door and come to heaven. It must be by the throne and the holy power of a living God that sits at the door of the sheepfold and says, I am the door. If any man wants to come to the Father, he has to come. By him, uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Uh, there is no other way. You know what? It's gotten old to us. Uh, we've held a key so long. Oh, my Lord. Anybody, any, I know these women probably don't have this problem. Any man besides me have keys that could choke a mule? You get keys out of your pocket and they look about like you have the keys to everything under heaven. It looks like you can unlock every door in Danville. You know what I'm saying? And, and I've got those kind of keys. I bring those keys out of my pocket, and, and I use like three of them. You know what I'm talking about. I could narrow it down to probably seven keys, but I got 25 or 100 because I never know when I might need that one. You know, I, there's keys on my key ring. I don't have them with me right now, but there's keys on my key ring that literally I don't even have a clue what they go to anymore. One says moon, and as far as I can tell is that it either has the key to the moon or a key to an old gun thing. Because I used to have a gun case. It was a, it was a, I, I don't really know. I think it goes to the gun case. I'm pretty sure it doesn't unlock the moon. But the reality is, is I have keys on my, on my keychain. I don't even know where they go to. I've not used them in so long I couldn't even tell you how, how, how they unlock or what they unlock. I use the master key for this church. I use a key. <laughs> we have about six doors to my office. Amen. That needs unlocked. But, but I have a key to my house and I have a key to a few other things. But the reality is, is that, 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 that those are the keys that I use more than anything else. And, and that key... Uh, that, that, that key that I don't use very much, it kind of gets overlooked, and sometimes I use it for a screwdriver. All the 
women are like, I don't understand what he's talking about. And all the men are like, man, that is right. Amen. Preach, brother. <laughs> when you need a screwdriver, that little moon key comes in real handy. Just ch -ch -ch. You turn that key. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> That's a lot of men. <laughs> the reality is, is that these are keys I don't use anymore because they've just became a part of who I am. They're just, I won't take them off my ring unless I ever need them. I just don't use them and I don't utilize them. I wonder how many people are waiting on the key of knowledge. And all we do is have it on our ring. Jesus used the key of knowledge to reveal himself. His sole purpose of spiritual authority and his knowledge that he wanted to give the church today. He said, I'm going to make sure that this church knows who I am. And I'm going to make sure they know why I came. I was going to preach to you today on a different subject. I was going to preach to you today on the purpose or on accident. Was it on purpose or was it on accident? And if I was going to talk to you about that today, my reality would be about the purpose of God. Are we doing the purpose of God or are we accidentally going through life? And the question is ringing in my ears this morning for it's probably a message to me. But what am I doing with the key of knowledge? Yes, sir. Yes. Many of you know more messages and word than most Bible scholars. You know how to argue with even preachers that are denominally trained in different secular movements and Moody Bible Institute, you know how to step back and say that there is not three but one. There couldn't be three co-equal, co-eternal persons, for there can only be one. You know how to argue that, but have we used that key? Do we just keep it on our key ring to show everybody we have it, or do we know how to use it? Could we utilize it in a moment's notice if that door needed to be unlocked? Have we let anybody in to the tabernacle or the temple today? Second key of the kingdom. I'm sorry if this is too much for you. The second key of the kingdom was authority of salvation. I will give thee unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loose on in heaven. Jesus speaks here to Peter all by himself. Later, he gives the power to bind and loose to all the disciples. He says, whatsoever you bind on earth, in Matthew 18 and 18, you shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loose to heaven. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that it shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. These keys were given to Peter all by himself. And then there's a return on the power of binding and loosing to the entire church body at that time. Peter, when did Peter ever use these keys, plural, to unlock anything? Not just one key, but many keys. Peter opened the way of salvation to the Jews in the first sermon in the New Testament church in Acts 2.38. When he said unto them, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this promise is unto you and to your children. And to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I come to tell you today that these keys are still relevant to the church. It's not something that the church has thrown away. It's not something that the church has gotten rid of. If it is, then Peter's words are null and void altogether. For even as many as the Lord our God shall call call if God is still calling people to repentance then he's still giving the Holy Ghost I come to preach to you today with the realization that tongues has not ceased uh, any more than prophecy has ceased. Uh, I've come to tell you today, right now, love is not perfected. Uh, and we must have that reality that the church is still on the move. Uh, we must have that reality that God is still trying to work on us. Uh, and there is still only one way into heaven. And that is more than just the blood covenant. You must become intimate with him. Uh, you must must become the bride. He opened the door to the Samaritans in Acts 8 when he told them they could receive the Holy Ghost. 
And finally, he was able to preach the first gospel to the Gentiles in Acts 10 when he used the same three keys to open the same door of salvation in all three cases. Now that the door opened he meant to the church, then the church begins to use the keys. Now it's my turn to lay my hands on the sick. Now it's my turn to pray the prayer of faith over people that have not received the Holy Ghost. Now it's my turn to see people healed. Now it's my turn to see blinded eyes open. Now it's my turn. Welcome to a church that still believes in the book of Acts. See, six of us do. Welcome to a church that still believes that there is a way for you to be saved more than just shaking a preacher's hand and joining a roll. Welcome to a church that still believes in mercy. It's more than just something we say we do. It's who we are. But God has given us a key that we must be able to use on a daily basis. It's not just for every once in a while. It's not just for the Old Testament or the New Testament church. Excuse me. Of the Acts program, but it's also for the church of today. It is for us. We must have the keys. God gives the church keys, but there's some keys that God wants to be able to have authority over. The first one is the key to the bottomless pit. He wants authority over the devil. I'm going to tell you, in Revelations 9 and 1, the Bible says the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This key of the bottomless pit is mentioned twice. It's first time it's given to Satan. And the second time it's given to an unknown angel. Satan has to be given the key to loose his own army from the place of punishment. And we find that when Jesus is casting out devils in Luke 8. That he casts some devils out and they say please do not send us into the deep. They didn't want to be bound in hell itself. And so first off Satan is given the key to loose the devils out of of the place of, of punishment. In other words, the plague in Revelation can't happen until God says it can happen. Until he gives that key to this satanic spirit. And in Revelations 20 and 1, the Bible says, I saw an angel that came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain was found in his hand. I saw a kingdom of heaven come down, or an angel from the kingdom of heaven come down and having the key to bottom of his pit with a great chain in his hand. This is the unknown angel, an angel of lesser rank. He's not even given a name. This isn't him. It's not Michael. It's, ne- it's just some angel came down from heaven. He came down to bind Satan for a thousand years. Satan is not bound today. First Peter 5 and 8 lets us know that the only way that we can even overcome the devil is to resist the devil. So Satan is not bound today. We, he can only do what he is allowed to by God. He's on, a, he's on a dog leash, if you will. God has him on a short leash. I was talking to Brother Wardwell. We was on our way to, because of the times with together and I was talking to him, I just was intermittently talking to him. And, and uh, Brother Adams was talking to him, and I, I just was talking to him. And, and he said, you know, I've never seen a big devil. That was the weirdest statement I've ever heard in my life. He said, he said, I've never seen a big devil. He said, every devil I've ever seen, when I see devils, they're always short. They're little. So uh, I thought, well, that explains some things. <laughs> so all the power that Satan's operating in, he's operating in somebody else's power. He's operating in the power that God permits him to operate in or the power that we allow him to operate in. It's quiet in this house this morning. So Satan is not this all-powerful being. Satan is not an omnipresent spirit. Satan is not an omnipotent spirit. 
Satan is limited to time and space. He's not God. He is not powerful like God. He is, I know I'm making him mad as a hornet right now. You start talking about what he's not and what God is, it starts getting all kinds of devils riled up. But the fact is, is that is how we have to understand this thing. We are not in the losing battle, folks. We are in the battle of God Almighty. We are in the army of God. Now, we might lose some battles, but we're not going to lose the war. The reality is, is that hell can come against us, but no weapon can prosper against us. The reality is, is that hell can do a lot of things, but it can never be victorious. The fact is, is that it might possess some people, but it can never possess the church. We have to have an understanding that God has got everything in control. He can only do what he is allowed to do. Man, God is going to give him a leash. When his time is up, I preached this to you a while back, but when his time is up, his time is up. When God says it's time to bless, it's time to bless. When God says it's time to cast out, it's time to cast out. And then he turns around and he says, you know what? This same key that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bind him with, I'm going to bind him with, I'm going to allow him to use to unleash the plague. So there's only two times that we see the key of hell. And then we see the key uh, or the key of the, of the bottomless pit. Then we see the key of, of, of death. And when the key of death is in operation, the Bible says in Revelations 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus has absolute power over physical and spiritual death. When he uh, said to the thief on the cross, this day you shall be with me in paradise. He was speaking of the abode of the dead and he was talking about the fact that he had Satan had had it under control since the garden of Eden however Jesus said I'm going to make sure that you not have the taste of death or the grave but you're going to come with me because I'm going to have the keys in just a few seconds I'm getting ready to go down and I'm getting ready to take back the keys that Satan has taken from me and when I get these keys back I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that I have the power over death and the grave Psalm 68 and 18, speaking of Jehovah, or some of you would say, God the Father, thou hast ascended on high, and thou hast led captivity captive, and thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Uh, thou hast led captivity captive. Ephesians 4 and 8, when it's speaking of Jesus, it says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Ezekiel 37 and 13 says you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves O my people and brought you up out of your graves uh, if you ask today Lazarus this question who is Jehovah he would scream back to you Jesus Christ uh, for he's raised me from the dead if you ask the widow of Maine today or her son who is Jehovah they would shout back with a loud voice it's Jesus the Christ for he has raised me from the dead if you ask the daughter of Jairus today who is Jehovah she would scream back it's Jesus the Christ for he has raised me from the dead if you would ask this preacher today and sister Martha Howard and everybody else that was in that vestibule that day who is Jehovah I would scream back to you it's Jesus the Christ for I have seen him raise people from the dead I'm not talking about a dead God I'm not talking about a dead church and I'm not talking about a God that's held captive by death we serve the only living God we serve the only living creator oh, I wish some apostolics would get a little more excited about this right here there you go. Roshando Ramotoya. I love that. I love that thing that was circling around on Facebook for a while that said, I'll take you to Muhammad's tomb. I'll take you to Buddha's tomb. I'll take you to everybody's tomb that's out there that claims to be a God. But I can only take you to an empty tomb when it comes to Jesus Christ. For he is the only risen Savior. He is the only risen Christ. 
I know some of y'all are getting sick of hearing some of the stories I tell, but I can only speak of those things which I know and which I have heard. So I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me, and this is mostly for some people that are here that haven't heard it before. But I went to this, this local pastor's uh, gathering not too long ago. Well, it was a few years ago now, about two or three years ago. And they came. They said, I want you to talk about what Easter means to you. And I came, and man, you don't ask me to come speak about what Easter means. Unless you want a message. So I stayed up all night praying and studying. I wrote everything out that I wanted to say. When I got there, there was, only, there was only a few of us there. Because everybody else had realized how crazy this one guy was. I hadn't figured that out yet. And so I showed up, and there was a church pastor there, one here. He was the one that was host pastor. We all came to his church. I guess you call it a church. And then there was a pastor beside me. And he was a nice man. I'd known him from the past. He's no longer in town. I don't know whether he got the boot or he left, but he ain't here anymore. And there's another pastor. And I don't know whether he got the boot or he left, but he ain't here anymore. And he brought his youth pastor. You got five people sitting there. And, uh. This person starts off the meeting. Thank you for coming. I'm so glad you all came. We just wanted to talk about what Easter means to us. We all get so busy this holiday season. Sometimes we can get messed up with, with all the, all the, all the uh, celebrations and things. We, we have to have help getting ourselves back to what it means. So he said, that's why I called this meeting is to tell each other what it means to us. Maybe that will solidify us back to what this thing means. I was like, that's great. Let's do it. I'm excited. I'm young, you know, just trying to be a good pastor, trying to represent you well. I even came, I even looked good. I didn't look like a slob when I walked in there. I, I might not have looked like a million bucks, but I did, I looked like at least 25. And I walked in, I sat down, we started talking, and I noticed the first guy, he, he has a church that called himself Christian, and uh I noticed he was like him hauling around. Obviously, he knew something I didn't. And he said, well, you know, Easter just, I, I don't know, just the cross and everything. Da, da. And he didn't say nothing. When he got done, I kind of was like, oh, da, 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 da. And then the next guy went, well, you know, it's just so good to know that Jesus died for our sins. And on Good Friday, we're going to come in. We're going to nail all of our sins to the cross. And we're going to do this in front of the whole church. And, and it's so powerful when we do that. And then we're going to take communion. We're going to leave. I'm like, we're, t we're not talking about Good Friday here, guys. He didn't say come tell what Good Friday means. I didn't know. I was dumb, you know. I was just sitting there thinking in my mind. So he got to me. <laughs> and I said, Easter is everything to me. It's everything to me. And I said, I love the cross for the blood, and I love the mercy of the blood, and I love the reality of the cross and the symbol of the cross. And I went through the whole thing about the cross and the nails and the thorns and the wounded for our transgression. I went through all that. And then I second that, I said, but let me tell you, it's more than that to me. I said, we believe in the power of resurrection. And I said, if I don't have resurrection power, I have a dead gospel. I, I didn't know. I said, if I have a dead gospel, then I have no hope. It means I'm dead in the same place that he's dead. It means I'm dead in my sin, just like he was dead, representing my sin. I said, I have no hope. And if I have no hope, I have no hope in the next life. And Paul said, if I have hope in this life only, I am of all men most miserable. I said, you got to understand something. We believe in the power of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, which means that he lives again. He's still on the throne, that he didn't have to die, that I went through the whole thing. I said, we believe in that. And this guy, when I got done, he looked at me. He said, I could tell by your voice when you said hello. Before you ever said what church you were from, I could tell by your voice that you were Pentecostal. I said, yeah, how's that? He said, because I used to come from a Pentecostal family. Uh-oh. I used to come from a Pentecostal family, and my family was screamers too. And I could tell you've been doing some screaming in the pulpit. 
I thought, yeah, that ain't all you could tell, buddy. You knew exactly what was going on. And then he started unveiling his beliefs. I don't think you have to believe in a resurrection. I don't think, I think the cross is enough. Matter of fact, we don't even preach the resurrection. Matter of fact, we don't even really just preach the gospel of Jesus. We kind of believe everything. Whatever goes. We'll open the Quran one day. The next day we'll open the Holy Bible. The next day we'll open this. And when he got done, I was like, what are we talking about here? I mean, I didn't even know there was such a thing. He didn't warn me. I didn't even know there was such a thing in this town as something like that. And when he got done, he was talking about how he didn't believe in the resurrection. He didn't believe that you had to believe that he came out of the tomb. He didn't believe that it even happened. Science kind of proves that maybe it didn't happen. And I got done. I thought, my Lord, no wonder he has a dead gospel. You ain't hearing me preach. I don't think you realize how powerful and how potent this moment is. This one key is that Jesus Christ is the only risen Savior that he lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And because he lives, all fear. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. Sorry today if I offend you, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. But I come to tell you, there is too many things pointing to this faith moment uh, for me to not believe. Uh, I've come to tell you, I feel you can try to excuse it. You can say that it was grave robbers at a tomb. Uh, you can do everything that the Pharisees tried to do back then. Uh, but the reality is, uh, is I have tasted uh, of this heavenly gift which is to come. I know he lives. I know he lives. God's not dead. He's still alive. God's not dead. He's still alive. God's not dead. He's still alive. I can feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. I feel him in my heart. I feel him all over me. God. Come on, somebody clap your hands and give the Lord a praise. We worship your name. I know I'm racing against snow today. Forgive me for taking some time there. If we don't preach this gospel, I said if we don't preach this gospel, we don't have the power of God unto salvation. It's more than just something we do. It's more than just a few words on a page. It's how we live. We live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Paul said, oh, that I may know him. In the fellowship of his suffering. And the power of his resurrection. I don't know about you, but I'd hate to go through all this suffering in this life. And then get to the end and find out there's no resurrection power. I'd hate to think that this gospel is so cheap that I could just do something so stupid just in the last minute. And just, phew, I'm gone. And I, and I don't even know the power of the resurrection is ready for me. I, I would hate to think that I would sell this thing down here at the end. Amen. Somebody's alarm's going off. Praise God. Tell them you're awake. Hallelujah. If it's the Lord, tell him I'm almost done. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 22, verse number 20. It reads like this. Our text said, I will come, make it come to pass in that day. I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government. Somebody say government with me. Thank you. Government. Into his hand he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the house of Judah. The key of the house of David. Everybody say the key of the house. 
will I lay upon his shoulder. Somebody shout his shoulder. For unto us a child is born. Everybody say a child. Unto us a son is given. Everybody say a son. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. This is Isaiah 9 and 6. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That reminds me of Isaiah 22, right? When he said, the government I will lay upon his, the key I will lay upon his shoulder. I will give him the key to the government. And the government, the key of the house of David, I will lay upon his shoulder. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I don't want to get into this every Sunday, but if you get old with it, just tell me, okay? Come up to me after church, say, Pastor, I'm tired of you preaching on one God. I'm tired of that Jesus name stuff. Give me a break here. You know. I, I, I feel in the Lord would have us know that somebody in this place is struggling with the mindset of what do I do? What, how do I follow after? What religion do I go after? I'm going to tell you, you don't need religion, baby. Pardon from my, my city language here. You don't need religion. You need to follow after the truth. Who cares about religion? I said, who cares about religion? Let's go down to the truth. Let's, let's buy the truth and sell it not. Let's find a way to believe the truth. What's the truth? There's so many people proclaiming the truth. Let's stop talking about what people proclaim and let's start talking about what the Bible says. I'm going to ask you a simple question. If you're, if you're wondering today, I'm going to ask you a simple question. How can the Father also be the Son? Or how can the Son be an everlasting Father? Jesus never had any children. It almost sounds sacrilegious to say that. Jesus never had any children. He, the Son, will be called the everlasting Father. How can He be the everlasting Father if they're two co-equal, co-eternal persons? There can only be one God. If there is that, if that verse is true, there can only be one God. But that isn't what I'm even wanting to show you today. The powerful part is Eliakim is a type and shadow of Jesus who said himself, he holds the key of David in his hand or upon his shoulder. The government, I Isaiah said will be upon this Jesus called the Christ shoulder the cross is going to come and that cross is going to be the power that holds the key of David in it Uh, revelations uh, we get down to Philadelphia what I was preaching from the beginning we get down to Philadelphia we get down to Philadelphia and he says he says this that is true that is holy he says this that has the key of David what's the key of David it's that cross that's on his shoulder it's that government that's being established he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth I'm going to tell you the third key that Jesus Christ has is the key for all of your problems I'm Oshay, I'm, I know we've been having a I've been having a struggle myself. Uh, I know we've been having a struggle uh, with our faith uh, because of all of hell breaking loose. Uh, we're fighting a new spirit, uh, a spirit we've never fought before, uh, a spirit that's damning up the works, uh, a spirit that's causing us to come up against a brick wall. Uh, the spirit of the Antichrist uh, is starting to push back against the church, uh, and people are not waxing, uh, are not getting themselves uh, to a place in God they're waxing worse and worse and we're wondering how do we get and fight against this generation I'm going to tell you it's not going to come by a newfangled thing it's not going to come by a newfangled thing it's not going to come by a snappy new song it's not going to come by a new revelation it's not going to come by something new that we've never seen before I know everybody, every generation wants to think they're unlocking the depths of sugar treasures, or excuse me, of the treasures of heaven, amen everybody wants to think that they're unlocking all the depths of of the sure fire and the power of God but I'm going to tell you right now there's nothing new under the sun 
only new thing that he established was his church that I know of. That he established that church and the power and the government of it. But once that church was established, he gave us the keys, everything we need. And people are seeking, amen, something for this world that we're living in. They're seeking something. Just like they did in Jesus' day. Blind men followed him. Amen. Crying, saying, Lord, have mercy on us. The woman of Canaan said, Lord, my daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. Have mercy on me. Blind Bartimaeus screamed out with his blindness, God, have mercy on me, thou son of David. Amen. Matthew 21 and 9 said, people began to cry out, Hosanna, which means the Lord saves or save now to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus came with the key, the open door for the church in Philadelphia. And that key was very simple. It was prophesied in the Old Testament about it it was prophesied in Isaiah 22 and Isaiah 9 that that key or that government would be established by the power that was going to be on his shoulder the power of the cross there's nothing greater but Jesus said I'm going to come to my end time church I hope that we're a Philadelphia church I do I want to be a Philadelphia church. I want to have love. I want to have love for one another. I want to see ourselves as one of those kind of churches. But the reality is, is that Jesus said, I'm coming and I'm going to give you an open door. Open door. How many would like to have an open door policy with God? An open door policy. Open doors. I would like to have a key policy with God. A policy where God lends me and and gives me the key abilities. That I can exercise my keys and he can exercise his keys in my life. I would like to have that kind of policy with God. There's three elements. To have that kind of policy with God. One. Is they had a little strength. Two. They kept his word. And three. They didn't deny his name. He will unlock the door of our circumstances. Or he will shut up and lock the doors of our enemies. If number one. We use what strength we have. Number two, we keep the commandments of the word. And number three, we pray in the name of Jesus. There was a man of God posted this on Facebook this morning. Brother Wright. He said, you can never learn what Jesus, or excuse me, you can never learn that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Everybody wants to know him as the provider. But until he's all you have, you can't learn that he's all you need. You don't know him as Jehovah Jireh down in the valley. You know him as Jehovah Jireh sacrificing on the mountain. It's the climb and the sacrifice that causes you to realize that you need a miracle or else you're going to find yourself killing the only promise you have. And God shows up in the nick of time and it's Jehovah Jireh. You don't know him as Jehovah Rapha until you're sick and he heals you. You can say you know him to be Jehovah Rapha for him or for him, but you can't say you know him to be Jehovah Rapha for yourself. He's just not that until he heals your body. <laughs> There's an old song. I, I, I know... We don't, have, we don't have as many songs about struggles anymore. It's, we just don't have it. It just doesn't, they don't write it. They don't write them about their struggles. But there's an old song that goes, and I know y'all know it so well, but it goes, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. You ready for the verse? I thank him for the mountain. 
Whoa. I got so tickled at Brother Wardwell. You know, he, he has this saying, and it is a, what in the world? I've never seen anything like it in my life, like that, like everything. He's never seen anything like it in his life, e- anything at all. Everything is the first thing he's ever seen in his life. <laughs> he said it, I don't know, how, am I telling the truth? He's like, what in the world? I've never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> he's like, you guys are crazy. I've never seen anything like you guys in my life, like that. That's just Brother Wardwell, that. He said it over and over and over again. I, I start getting tickled. Everything, he's never seen anything like it in his life. So I, I'm going to do a little bit of, of brother, brother Wardwell here. I and thank him for the mountain. What in the world? I don't want any of that kind of stuff happening to me. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Mountain? Valleys? I mean, let me tell you something. When God starts giving us trials to test us and prove us, you would think that all hell is breaking loose. You would think, I mean, I, I got tickled this morning. I, I know it's snowing like, like a blizzard outside, and, and we might not even get to have church tonight. But I got, I got tickled so much this morning, I, I, I was laughing, you know, because people are texting me. Are we, are we going to have church? <laughs> I walked outside at 645, and it's like, it's like I know it got worse as the time went on, but it, it, it's like a slushy. That's all it was, like, like a slushy. It wasn't even slick at that time. I'm like, Seriously? Have church. I remember pushing Faye Arthur out of here with bald tires in nine inches of snow. And finally, her tires catch. Finally. And I fell flat on my face. I'm pushing her. I'm like 12. I probably wasn't doing anything. But everybody else helped me push her. We're all pushing. And finally, her tires catch. And I'm like. And her muffler just gave me a muffler bath. Y'all know what I'm talking about, that big boat she used to work. Drive in here, that big brown car. I push that thing out of here, man. It's like pushing an army tank out of here. I came in that kind of stuff, you know. Bald tires. Short. Come on, you're gonna hurt your feelings. I don't mean to, you know, but I'm, I I kind of wondered, you know, we never had elders ever until the 2000s. Notice that? Never. Nobody was ever concerned about the elders till the last six years. You know, let's have church. Well, what about Gertie Thomas? She'll get here, praise God. <laughs> now, in the last six years, we finally have elders. Scott Graham told the funniest story, and it reminded me of you, elder, and I hope you don't get offended at this because it's not meant to be offensive. It's meant to be praising. But he said, he said, last year, 2014, and I know what he's talking about. He said, every Sunday. It was snowing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Every Sunday. It, like, it was like fine all week. Dried up. It was like crystal clear outside. Saturday, there will be a chance of 20 inches of snow on Sunday morning. <laughs> and, and he said, I, he, go, he said, I was like, you got to be kidding me, God. Can't you help me out here a little bit? And so he said, finally, one Sunday, it just aggravated me. He said, we're having church. And he sent, out a, he sent out a call all over the church. He said, I want every man that's available here with shovels because we're having church today. And he said, we're all out there scooping up the sidewalk and everything, just clearing everything off. He said, there's tons of us. And he said, it starts really snowing. And he said, I got to thinking, well, Scotty, you put your foot in your mouth. I don't say that disrespectful. That's just what he said. You put your foot in your mouth now. It's snowing up a storm. And maybe you should go. You know, it's almost 8 o'clock here. Maybe you should go cancel church, call everybody, and tell them not to come. And he said, I just got done thinking that thought. And this car pulls in. And he said, this guy gets out of his car and gets in the back seat and gets his walker out. And he starts into the church. I'm just telling you his story, so don't get mad at me, okay? Get mad at Scott Graham. Starts in the church. And he said, brother, you don't need to come to church. We might be canceling here. I was just trying to see if we could get it cleared off. But he said, it's snowing now. He said, he looked up at me like he was offended. He said, pastor, are we having church this morning? I was planning on it. He said, well, if we're having church this morning, I'm going to be here. I ain't staying home.
man, I'm in, a, I'm in deep water. Get me out of the water. <laughs> Get me out of water here. I don't want to be in this water. Mountains. Nobody wants mountains. Valleys. Nobody wants valleys. Problems. Nobody wants problems. But everybody wants a problem solver. I, I went to these meetings where Lee Stone King gets up. And he starts telling all the stuff that's happened in the last 45 years, you know, to him. And he's just, he's going through this whole plethora of things. And people are hanging from the chandeliers. I mean, they're going berserk. They're going nuts. He talks about this one family. They tried everything, everything and failed, everything and went wrong. And they finally was having, having, uh, having to go in for surgery. He talks about this, this man that starts speaking in tongues. And this Indian hearing him, this Indian doctor hearing him in his native language. And he talks about angels being in the room and people are going berserk. But how would you like to be that family? We all love, 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 love baby Noah and the miracle that he is. But how would you like to be Jonathan Reese when it was happening in their life that they couldn't see the light of day? Everybody loves the miracle, but nobody loves the miracle working power of God that has to happen because you can't have a miracle without an issue. You have to have a leg that's half crippled or you have to have a leg that's shorter than the other. And there has to be somebody walk and there has to be a man by the gate beautiful before there could ever be an Acts 3. And the man by the gate beautiful had to go through it for 40 years before he could ever be healed that one day. We love the story of the moment of the miraculous, but nobody wants to go through the mess to get there. And I'm telling you right now that God is wanting you to have an understanding that unless you use what little strength you have, you cannot have an open door policy with him. He said they have used their little strength. They have a little strength. They have a little strength. They have just tried their best. They don't have everything going for them. They are not General MacArthur. They are not the perfect person. But they have a little strength. And what little strength they have, they have used it for the good of the kingdom of God. A little strength they have. Second thing he says, they have to keep the commandments of the word of God. You have kept my word. You want an open door policy? Keep and obey the voice of the Lord. The word of God is what we need to get back to. Reading the word, speaking the word, talking about the word, sitting around at McDonald's and instead of gossiping, listening to each other, talk about how bad things are, how people hurt your feelings, talk about the word. You know how much power we used to have when all we did was talk about the word? Just the word powerful than anything else was being able to talk about the word with my friends. More powerful than going to conference was more was the thing of talking about the word with people. And the last thing is he says, you have not denied my name. You have prayed in the name of Jesus. You've not denied my name. Scott Graham I know I've brought up him up twice or three times, and I apologize, but Scott Graham was talking to us young men, and he said, I would like to give you something. If I can give you anything, he said, there's a few perspectives I'd like to leave with you. And I was gleaning from him. And he said this. He said, the Lord spoke to him and said, Scott, he said, uh, I want to tell you something. He said, my house is not just church anymore he said I I am in you you're my temple you Tom Blue Ball the temple of God that's why it's so important not to abuse the temple that's why it's so important not to abuse the temples because this our body is now the temple of God if you know a Bible for that I can give you a Bible stay after church the body is the temple of God so he said, if we're the tef- he said, if you're the temple, Scott, he said, I'll tell you what you need to start realizing is that I, res- I restored my temple to what I wanted it to be in my ministry when I drove out the money changers and all that. And I said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. You made a dead piece. House of prayer. And he said, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Scott. 
It's not supposed to be a house of preach. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. He said, more than you study for messages, more than you get up and preach, I need you praying more than you do any of that. If you study for six hours, that's great. You need to pray more than you study, Scott. Ooh, he said, man, God smote my heart. He said, it's not a house of preach, Scott. It's a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a house of preach. He said, you got to bring it back to a house of prayer. When he said that, God began to push something into my spirit. Jesus has the key to every situation. He can unlock any door. But he cannot come in until we pass some tests. See, in Revelations, he didn't give that to everybody. He didn't come in and say, I give you an open door no man can shut. He didn't give that to the church in Ephesus. He didn't give that to the church in Laodicea. He gave that to the church of Philadelphia because they had some key attributes. They didn't deny the name. They would made sure they studied the word and read the word and kept the word. And they had a little bit of strength and they used what strength they had to be the people of God. He said, I'll give you an open door policy if you'll just give me an open door policy. And so when I heard Brother Graham say that, it smote my heart. And I was sitting there studying and pondering over that. And one of my friends, he, he, he got in the car with me. And he said, I've been going everywhere. And I've been saying something that's made a bunch of people nervous. And I've had pastors come up to me after church and said, don't say that. Don't ever say that again. But he said, everywhere I've been going, I've been telling people, God does not answer prayer. He answers specific prayer. He said, he answers Jesus' name prayer. We can't get in this thought process that God has to answer my prayer. He said, if you ain't praying to Jesus, if you're not calling on his name, if you're not praying specific prayers. And he said, you want Bible? I can give you Bible. He says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not prayer availeth much, the effectual fervent prayer. There's a specific type of prayer. Jesus teaches us how to pray. He didn't say, just open up your mouth and start talking to me. He said, you want to know how to pray? I'll give you a specific order. I'll give you a specific reality. I'll, I'll make sure you have an understanding that there is a way to pray. I'll make sure that you get to the reality that first you better address who you're praying to. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I've come to tell you today, church, I know so many times we get bent out of shape and we get hurt and we get we get so wounded and we have so many issues and we don't get to a place of prayer. And God is calling us back. If you want an open door policy, you want to see the miraculous, God's ready to give the miraculous. You want to see supernatural things, God's ready to give supernatural things. But it's going to have to come when we have a little strength, when we keep his word and we don't deny his name. We don't deny his name. Solomon was talking to God. He was asking God, please hear the prayers of the people that have prayed in this place. And God said, I've got a formula I'll give you. He said, if I shut up heaven, then there's no rain. If I do that, not Satan, if I, if I do that. If I do some things where I start blocking you off, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves. Not just go in there in any old way and just start saying, God, I need you to answer this prayer right now. I'm sick and tired of going. No, humble yourself and pray and seek my faith. There has to be a name that's not denied. There has to be ability for humility. There has to be a seeking power of God. He said, if they'll do that, then I'll do this. I'll open up windows. If we can get ready, I'm going to give an altar call. <coughs> I wouldn't hurt anybody for anything in the world. I wouldn't hurt anything. Anybody for anything in the world. 
forget who it was the other night. I was standing. I think I was talking to the Coopers and Brother York. And uh, we were talking about Jacqueline. I thank God for Jacqueline coming through that okay. And, and uh, God hopefully will keep that issue uh, from reoccurring. I'm, the Yorks and, and myself and especially Lord Jacqueline, we're, we're tired of that. We're ready for God to intervene for on our behalf. Amen. I think we were back here talking and somebody said something about they know who to call when they need prayer. Remember that? I think it was we was talking about that. They know who to call when we need prayer. And as long as long as they know who to call when we need prayer. And I thought, man, that's so true. And uh, so I thought about this. I, I've, I've been in my house in the last few weeks and people say, pray for me. And I'm, I'm starting to try to work on my boldness even more than I always already have. And I, so I just immediately, I grab the phone, I call them, I say, are you ready? I'm going to pray right now. Yeah, I'm ready. And so we start praying. And I pray over the phone. And the Lord begins to show me things. And he begins to let me see things. And I see different visions and seeing different things. But finally... Somebody finally come to me and said, Pastor, I want you to know I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, what's that? Well, you know, we haven't been, and I haven't been, and this hasn't been. I'm going to tell you something. I, I speak to you as a pastor, not evangelistic. God can't heal you until you do something too. He can't. He can't heal you if you're... I mean, I can pray till I'm blue in the face, and God can, he can show his, he can, he can, he can show his favor on my faith, but the fact is, is that if you're just sitting there, if you're not even acknowledging him, you know, I, I've prayed for somebody, and, it, and, and they just look at me while I'm praying for them. You ever, I don't know how many people you've prayed for, but you ever prayed for somebody that don't go to church, and you walk up to them and say, can I pray for you? Yes, you can pray for me, and you put your hand on them and start praying for them, and they're just staring at you. They're just looking at you like, what, what, what am I supposed to do? They don't know what you're supposed to do. It's amazing that people that are raised around church can be so disconnected from God. That you can be praying for them and they can have that same kind of mindset. I understand it in a child. I understand it. But even Jacqueline, you know, I mean, Jacqueline comes in. She's calling for prayer. You know, please pray for me, Pastor. I, you know, the other night they got in a car accident. She's calling, God, help me pray for me. And I felt the Holy Ghost. And, man, God just helped there. Hopefully, God, I, I heard she called angel, too. So, you know, if you can't, if the pastor doesn't work, call on the angels. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's nice to have an angel in our church. I pastored a few devils, now I got an angel in my church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Just joking. I said all that to say this. Somebody hit me up and said, Pastor, I didn't realize till you started praying how disconnected I am. When you started praying over the phone, I started realizing I haven't been doing what I know I can do. I started realizing I haven't been where I've been uh, in the past with God. I'm not, I'm not strong in the Lord like I used to be. Pastor, I want to apologize. I thought, man, it's so awesome. I wish everybody would get to that realization. That if we're not doing what we can, and we're not getting in the word, and we're not praying, there's no open door policy with God. The policy with God. I want God to walk into my life and start casting out devils. I want God to walk into my life and start rebuking sickness. I want God to walk into my life and start healing things into my spirit. I want God to walk into my life and I want him to have full control. I want him to open a door that no man can shut. I want him to shut doors that no man can open. I was praying for Brother LaFoon the other day. He asked me to pray for him. I was praying for him. I said, God, give him favor that even if this job doesn't work out, I want you to give him favor 
either way that even if this job doesn't work out, he will get a job that is even better than the one he's got right now. No matter what happens, I want you to give him favor, God. He came to my house. He didn't know how I prayed. He came to my house, and he increased my faith so much, and I needed it. He said, Pastor, he said, I was on my way to get that interview, and my boss stopped me and said, Hey, man, hold on. Time out. Whoa. <laughs> because it was the same company. He said, hold on just a second. I want to do this. I want to offer this. And he said, Pastor, I have two options now. I can, if I don't get this interview job, I still got an option to move up in the company and do better things and greater things. And, I, and I, he didn't have a clue how I prayed. He's standing there telling me that. I thought, man, that's what I want to be able to have happen. I want to be able to pray for favor and seek God work it out on behalf. I want to be able to pray that God gives us ability and see God start giving people ability. I want, I want God to be able to hear my prayer. I don't want to pray and look like a prayer to a wall. I want to pray and get the voice of God. I want to hear the voice of God. I want to know God. How are we going to do that? It's very simple. I got to do everything I can and he'll start doing what he can. I got to start reminding him of his word and he'll start coming down and giving me his promise. I got to start praying in the name and talking to the name and going through the name and preaching the name and speaking the name. And I'll start seeing the God of the name show up. God, Roshamo, Rosaihamo, Patai. There's somebody in the sound of my voice that you have been so hurt. You have been so wounded. You have been so messed up in your own mind. Hell is trying to push you into a corner to get you to feel like there is no hope for you because you've been hurt. And in that hurt, you only have one option. But I've come to tell you that's not the only option. There's an option in Jesus Christ. God is offering you and extending you a hand of mercy. And he wants you to know he loves you. He wants you to know that if you'll keep your keys and you'll keep your spirit and you'll get right with God today, then he'll give you the keys that you need and he will open doors that no man can shut. He will shut doors. No man can open. We stand all over this building. We're going to go into a place of prayer. I wonder if we can't just turn this place into a prayer room. I wonder if we can't just pray right where we're at. Let me lay our hand on somebody around us right now. And just begin to pray. Just begin to talk to God. God, I want an open door policy. I'm going to start exercising the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to start exercising the keys to the kingdom. Come on, saints of God, if you have that authority, why don't you start binding on earth what shall be bound in heaven? Why don't you start loosing on earth what shall be loosed in heaven? Come on, saints of God, if you have that authority, why don't you start exercising it? God, I want to get back to doing what I can, and you'll start doing what you can. I want to get back to doing what I can. No matter what I'm going through, no matter my trial, no matter what I'm having and wrong in my life, no matter how bad things are, I want to get back to doing what I can. I have a little strength. I just kept the little strength. I just kept the word. You've not denied my name. Therefore, I'm going to give you an open door. Pastor, I'm tired of not being blessed. I want a blessing. Well, I just preached to you the way of the blessing. I just told you how to be blessed. The Holy Ghost wants to bless you this morning. The Holy Ghost wants to uplift you right now. The Holy Ghost wants to change your spirit. The Holy Ghost wants to give you new life. The Holy Ghost wants to touch you in a way that only He can. God in your name, Sero Moremo, Sero Moremo, Sati Hamasa. Give us an open door policy, oh God. Whenever we speak, Shahama Yakayama Sata God wants to heal hurt right now. God wants to heal hurt right now. There's somebody in here that's been hurt by people. God wants to heal you right now. There's no reason for you to leave the way you came. Why don't we lift our hands all over this building, no matter who we are or where we are. Why don't we lift our hands all over this building and allow God to heal people around us. Come on, do what you can. If you can, why don't you repent today? 
If you can, why don't you call on the name of Jesus today? If you can, why not? If not, I'm a preto, the caro, my preto, sitara, my para, my ter, and yet, my rama, the caro. Holy Ghost. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Whenever we say his name, things begin to change. There's healing in the name. Lord is directing me a certain way. I'm going to try to flow in the gifts right now. Brother Shatwell, Brother Shatwell preached a message called The Tragedy of a Wounded Spirit. If you've never heard it, you need to hear it. It's a very good message. But in that, he was talking about how he had to forgive different things and different people, and God showed him five steps. And he said, I, I had gotten through most of the steps. And he said, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you need to pray, and you need to, to tell me, you need to forgive me. He said, forgive you, Lord. What are you talking about, forgive you? He said, no, I can't forgive you. <laughs> he said, you got to forgive me. He said, no. He said, you have to forgive me because you're blaming me for things, and it's not really me that did it, but you have to be willing to let it go and forgive me because you're blaming me. He said, you're blaming me. You say it's my fault that this happened, that I didn't do this or I didn't do that. I didn't show you this or show you that. And he said, you, you're blaming me, so you got to forgive me. Somebody in this room, you think you've gotten through the spirit of forgiveness to the point that you don't have to forgive anymore because you've forgiven everybody. But the one person that you haven't forgiven is, God, why did you let this happen? I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm just telling you what the Lord impressed upon me here and I know this is kind of off the path of my message but the Lord wants you to know how much he loves you before you leave just in case you don't get back here tonight you need to know he loves you enough that he sent me to speak to you you think you forgave everybody but you haven't forgiven why did this have to happen to me God why did you let this happen to me, God? I, I tried. I did everything I do to do, and this happened to me. It's time that you release that right now in your spirit. Folks, there's a healing that needs to take place, and there's a spirit that's fighting against that healing. Why don't we just love God one last time as we walk in the spirit right here? Why don't we love God one last time? God, why did you let this? No, 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 no. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. For I have held grudge against you. I've had, I've held again. You know, I didn't have a problem forgiving them on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they knew not what they do. But, but, but I, I have a problem right now. Jesus, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah, Jesus. I know that was the word of the Lord. I know it was. So I'm going to say one more story. For the word was said he was 
sitting there one year and preacher was preaching and preacher was talking about forgiving your brother and having all against your brother and he said when they got done preaching everybody started going to each other and hugging each other and he said I'm just looking around like come on let's go to the next part I'm tired of this moping groping stuff I don't have all against anybody I love everybody and the Lord said you need to pray he said I fell down on my knees and I said okay God what do I need to pray I have no odd against anybody he said yes you do you have odd against your brother he said, I do not. He said, I don't have one person right now I can think of that I don't like. And he said, the Lord said, it's me. You have ought against me. You don't understand why I let that happen. You have ought against me. I'm your brother. I'm the wounded man right here. And you have ought against me. Because you think that I've hurt you. You think I've let things happen to you. And it's not the truth. And he said, you have ought against me. Un, un, it's, not even will, it's not even right. You, you have it. And you don't even know that you have it. And he said, it's time for you to repent. And he said, I begin to weep uncontrollably. I think in this house today, there's somebody here that you've tried to keep the name. And yet, you're having a struggle. And you've tried to stay in the word. And yet, you're having a struggle. And you can't seem to figure out what's going on. The truth is, is you've got to come back to the reality that God loves you. And that is a simple faith. But some of you have doubted. Somebody in this room, maybe one person. I think I'm only reaching for maybe one. But somebody in this room has doubted the love of God. Why did he let that happen to me? I'm going to tell you, God did not let that happen. One thing that God did is He gave man free will. He cannot control what we do. He cannot control who we marry. He cannot control who we come in contact with. He cannot control who we allow in our lives. He cannot do it. And He might have put so many roadblocks in our way and we ignored every one of them. And now we're blaming Him for something that He didn't even do. You have ought against God. Somebody in this room. I wonder if we can't just one last time as Brother Adams comes. I wonder if we can't lift our voice and pray and ask God. I know this is an awkward moment right here. I wonder if we can't lift our voice and pray and ask God, God, have your way in my life. God, I want to have every bit of my strength dedicated to your spirit. I don't want to fall short of the God. I don't want to fall short of the glory. I don't want to fall short of the glory of God short of the glory of God I don't want to fall short of the glory of God all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but if I'm short of the glory when the glory comes how am I going to make it heaven my own God forgive me if I got odd against you forgive me if I have odd against you forgive me if I have odd against you of Jeremy Valen, God, I clean out every part of my heart. I clean out every part of my spirit. Come on, I want an open door policy. I want an open door policy. I don't want to be held back. I don't want to be held captive. I want an open door policy with God. I want an open door policy with God. Jesus, forgive me. Change me. I want to see the miraculous hand of God in our life. God, I want to give you my strength. Yeah.
of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Whenever we say his name, things begin to change. There's power in the name of the Lord. There's power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Whenever we say his name, things begin to change. Power in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Whenever we speak his name, things begin to change. There's power in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's lift our hands all across this sanctuary this morning and thank him for the word of God that we have heard. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's amazing to me the more we think God doesn't know where we are, the more he shows us, I know exactly where you are. Hallelujah. He loves us so much. Loves us so much. Thankful for the word of the Lord this morning. It is still snowing outside. So please be careful as we, as we dismiss this afternoon. Be safe on the roads. And uh, Lord willing, the tide will turn. Snow will melt away and it'll be 50 degrees tonight and we'll have church. That's faith. <laughs> Jesus' name. Today at, at 2.30, um, we'll be outreach at, at Danville Regional Rehab Center. We'll be service at 2.30 p.m. Tonight, service will be at 6 o'clock. If things do change, uh, we will send out a one call. Pastor will let everyone know what's going on, but we're going to speak in faith, believing that we're going to have service this evening. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name. East side, center section, west side, as we get ready to march, giving and tithing and building fun. Don't forget to shake someone's hand on your way out and tell them how good it is to see them in the house of the Lord, especially all of our visitors. East side, center section, west side, you're dismissed in Jesus' name.